Good to be back before the Trail of Tears conference. Um, first things first, the University of Oklahoma is winning. <laughs> I don't know how you feel about that. Dustin Eastland, who works for me, uh, and he's a Sooner fan, of course, or otherwise he couldn't. Uh, 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 this is how much I love the Trail of National Trail of Tears Association. It's the fourth quarter in the OU game. I'm an OU alum, and I'm right here with you. Because I think what you all do is terribly important. I really do. I think it's very important. I appreciate uh, the introduction by my friend, and former council colleague Jack Baker. I appreciate the presence of uh, council lady Julia Coates, who's back on the council. Of course, history and, and, and community is important to her, so I'm pleased that she's here. I think we had another councilman, Wes Nofire, who, I don't know if he's here, but he has been here. Um, and I think, you know, Troy Wayne and I were talking, I think more officials from the Cherokee Nation ought to come see what you all do, because again, I think it is critically important that you continue the important mission that you're on. That is a mission that you all established, my goodness, over 20 years ago, about 25 years ago at this right. point, 1993, to keep the promise of what the Congress of the United States really made when they established the National Trail of Tears system. And you all do it so well. And I think it's the role of the Cherokee Nation to get behind you, support you in any way that we can. Because, look, the Cherokee Nation today is prosperous and we generate a lot of revenue. We do a lot of good for our people. I'm going to touch a little bit on that. Um, but the truth of the matter is the, the work on the front lines in terms of historic preservation, in terms of keeping the stories alive, and keeping the national memory of the Trail of Tears alive, that is important. It is important that this country not forget what the government of the United States did 180 some odd years ago. It's important. It matters that young people growing up in this country, whether they're Cherokee, whether they're non-Cherokee, understand that that happened. The country has a lot of great things that it should embrace and celebrate, and it has a lot of dark chapters that it has to recognize, it has to acknowledge, not just what happened to Indian peoples on this continent, but other chapters. But that is important, of course, to everyone in this room. And part of it is because we ought to understand where we've been and not repeat it. I mean, the government of the United States rounded people up in stockades, rounded people up in cages, didn't they, when they forced our removal. The government of the United States is never at its best when it's rounding up civilians in cages. That's true in the 1830s, and it's true in 2019. That's the way I feel about it. But I think we ought to remember that history so that we're a better country for it. And I think that we'll be a better country for it too if we understand what Indian nations mean. Every time something pops up in the media that has to do with tribes, of course you all live it and breathe it every day. It means something to you and me as well. But for most of the country, it's not something that's a subject that is on their minds every day. So when something comes up about somebody running for president talking about their DNA or or, or, or some pipeline protest, suddenly it's in the national consciousness. And that, those are times that there's a lot of misinformation out there, but it's also times when we can seize the opportunity to find teachable moments for this country and remind them of the dark chapters and also talk about what's going on today. So I want to talk a little bit about what's going on today with the Cherokee Nation. Your time is very valuable and you're doing a lot at this conference. I don't want to burden the agenda too much. Uh, we also have an event going on next door for photo IDs. But, you know, Troy Wayne mentioned uh, Chief Buffington, who was chief from Benita, the last chief from Benita, 120 years ago. And, and he's right, when Chief Buffington became chief of the Cherokee Nation, he saw, and you can read it in contemporary, contemporary accounts of his election, and, things that he said. He was clearly looking at a Cherokee Nation from a governmental standpoint that was in decline because the government of the United States was imposing allotment, state of Oklahoma, on top of a great Indian nation, suppressing the great Cherokee democracy that when it was allowed to thrive did great things for its people. I think that's always been true. When we've been allowed the God-given right to self-govern, we've done amazing things. And when that right has been taken away, we could not take care of each other. We suffered for it. I think actually our friends and neighbors suffered for it. I think our friends and neighbors go to Oklahoma, many of you are from there, 
Ask our friends and neighbors who are non-Cherokee if they're glad the Cherokee Nation is a functioning, progressive, dynamic government. They'll tell you that they're glad that we are, that we contribute so mightily to the economy, to the cultural fabric of our region. But he was chief at a time when that was in decline, and I don't know if he would have predicted, I suspect he probably would not have predicted a time when our democracy would come back as it did beginning in the 1970s. So I like to say that Chief Buffington took office when the sun, from his perspective, from the perspective of his contemporaries, was setting on the Cherokee Nation. I have the good fortune, because of so many people that came before me, but I have the good fortune to take office at a time when the sun is rising on our democracy, when the best days, I think, remain ahead of us, when we can look forward to strengthening our government, and we can do things that a government ought to do to build a great society. And those are some of the things that we're doing back home. I just want to touch on a few of those things. We're doing things to help elders, I think, like we've not done before. Help them particularly with their homes. So we have a backlog of Cherokee elders who, if we don't help them, things that you and I take for granted, roof not leaking on our heads, the ability to get in and out of our bathrooms or even our homes when we reach a time in our life when those things are difficult. If we don't help those elders, then I don't think anyone else will. And they're on a list to get help and it's languished for a while. So we're taking the revenue that we generate from our businesses. If you ever lose in our casino, I'm getting ready to tell you, it goes to a good cause. <laughs> And we're going to put about $30 million into it, the full support of the council, including council codes, of course. Um, but we're going to put that into fixing those homes. And we're going to also put it into community organizing to make sure that our community buildings are places that are safe, that are sound, where young people can come and grow up as Cherokees in Cherokee communities. And that's important. That's important no matter where you are in the country. It's certainly important back home. And our view of it is, is that if elders have to worry about water leaking on them, or even having water, or getting in and out of their bathrooms, they won't have time to do the things that they want to do. We want them to do that for generations Cherokee elders have done, which is pass down those stories to young people, to the generation coming up. Pass down what it means to be Cherokee. Keep those stories alive and even those dark chapters that Again, the country ought to know about, but our young people ought to know about them too. When you go around and visit with them, we've got a lot of work to do with the generation coming up in terms of keeping them knowledgeable and mindful about Cherokee history. That's an obligation that each and every one of us share. So elders are in a position to do it if they don't have to worry about things like their home falling apart. We've got an obligation to do that. We're in a position to do it, so that's what we're doing. We have some other initiatives. We're investing in our workforce back home. Raise the minimum wage to $11 an hour. I don't know what the minimum wage here is in Kentucky, but I know that the minimum wage set by Congress is $7.25 an hour. It's $11 an hour now at the Cherokee Nation. That's an investment in our workforce. Our workforce has done such great things to get us where we are. Long before I was chief, of course, I've only been chief a short time. They've been working hard every day to make the lives of Cherokees better. So part of that is to reward them for what they're doing, but part of it's investing in them in our communities because the Cherokee workforce is made by and large Cherokee citizens that live in communities and if they can spend more money in their communities and have more secure futures, well that makes our community stronger. And that goes back to, again, that next generation coming up. We want them to come up in communities that are strong for so many reasons, so many reasons, but not the least of which is keeping that sense of what it means to be a Cherokee in a Cherokee community. And you can find that all over the country now because Cherokees are getting together, as Councilor Coates could tell you, because she helped organize them all over the country where Cherokees get together. But they're doing it back home as well. We've got to give them support to do it. Part of giving them support is to strengthen those communities. That means investing in things like elder housing. That means investing in our workforce. It means a whole host of things that we have to do to keep those communities strong. A couple of other things that we're working on. If you go through Cherokee Nation, you can see the big casinos. We ought to be proud of those. Those generate a lot of revenue, a lot of jobs. And if you dig a little deeper, you can see a more diversified business portfolio than first meets the eye. We do a lot of things in a lot of different areas. A business presence in about 47 states, 14 countries around the world. That generates a lot of revenue. And we have programs that are growing up stronger. You can go there and see 
the largest outpatient health center in the country for Native Americans. And that's a sign of progress and a sign of strength. It's something that didn't just happen yesterday. It's taken years to get to that point. And those things are all great. And that's what a government ought to do to help secure a good future for the citizens that it serves. But in a few generations, if we have big casinos and we have a great health care system and we have other businesses that generate revenue, but we've lost our Cherokee language, we will have lost so much of what it means to be Cherokee. And that's true even though most of us, including me, don't speak the Cherokee language because there's something about that still existing in our communities, that people still speak it and want to learn it, that is uniquely Cherokee. That's true of any people. So we're down to about 2,000 first language fluent speakers in a tribe of 380,000 citizens. And that's a daunting figure. That's a discouraging figure. And if you look at sort of what age range these speakers are in, it gets even more discouraging because they're on in their years. But we take an oath of office to not only uphold the Constitution, but to preserve Cherokee culture and our language. And we aim to keep that oath. And so we're putting an investment of about $16 million into our language. We're going to expand the programs that we have so that generations from now, when you go into these Cherokee communities, we want them to be prosperous from an economic standpoint. We want them to be strong in terms of the infrastructure, whether it's housing, whether it's things that make a community just continue to go. But we also want them to be Cherokee communities, and the language is a key part of that. So I want you to know that we're making a big investment in that. And language is such a part of culture. And culture is really so much of what you all are about, because history is also a part of culture. So one other area that I want to touch on and make an announcement about, the Saline Courthouse back home. Many of you have visited that site. And, you know, it's seen better days, but at least it's here because so many of our courthouses are gone. I don't know if that's, if Councilor Coates can correct me, is that the only one standing left? I think it's uh, Jack Baker, I don't know, the original. So next month, weather permitting, everything going as it should, we will open that facility having completed a major phase of rehabilitation of that facility so the Cherokee people, our friends and neighbors can come see that important part of our history. And that's gonna be a proud moment when we open that up. And those of you that can, I hope that you join us. It's a proud moment for this reason. I told you what you know, which is that the Trail of Tears was a dark chapter. And when I get a chance to talk to people, particularly non-Cherokees, I like to remind them what happened in this country for, with respect to removal. But I also like to tell them this, and this is a point of pride, and you all know it. I think our young people ought to know it. After removal, we built ourselves back up, and you would have predicted that a people that were marched across the country, lost a quarter of their population, had their economic system ripped in half, had their political system ripped in half, developed factions that were literally at each other's throats. You would predict it would take generations to rebuild if they ever rebuilt at all. But we all know, everyone in this room knows that it didn't, didn't take generations. We got about the business of investing in what it means to build a great society after we were removed. We did not give up. We stood back up. And one of the standing, shiny examples of standing back up is that we invested in a system of justice. So you can go down to downtown Tahlequah and see the old Capitol building that is now a wonderful museum. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go do it. It's a great museum. It tells our people, and it, I think just as important, it tells the world what happened in Tahlequah after removal, that we built back up. The same is true for the Saline Courthouse. Again, it represents that investment that a great democracy, based on the rule of law, ought to do, which is to invest in a system of justice. And we can tell the world that story even better with the completion of that facility. So I'm very proud that we are getting to that point where we can open that up, and I hope you can all come and celebrate with us. There is a lot more to do in the future, and to the extent that I can do anything as chief to help you, well, I want to do it, because I am in your corner, because I believe you're doing important work. I believe you're keeping a promise that was made, that only people that have it in their heart can keep. Congress can pass all the laws at once. It can even appropriate funds from time to time, but I think it takes people who have a passion for preserving history, for telling our story, to really go out and do it right. And that's the way I see the National Trail of Tears Association. I appreciate the work that you do. A couple of things that are on my mind that I'd like to do to help, if, if the help would be 
something you want is we have the photo ID event that we've had now. This is the second year. I'd like to continue to do that. What I'd like to do is to somehow get that to introduce Cherokees to what you're doing whenever you have your conference. I think you'll be in Cherokee, North Carolina last year. You were in Decatur last year. Or you'll be in Cherokee next year. You were in Decatur last year. If, I, if, we, if bringing Cherokee citizens who might have an interest in what you're doing and might have a desire to pitch in and we can have the photo ID sort of be the pool for that, but then they can get exposed to the wonderful work that you do, that's kind of what I had in mind. So right now in, in the scheduling snafu, we, we had kind of on our end, but we're across at the hotel. But in the future, if we can do anything to bring those events a little closer physically and then both as a part of the program, and bring new people in. If that's something that'd be welcome, that's kind of what I'd like to do because I think more Cherokees ought to know what you're doing and I think there's a hunger among our people no matter where they live to do something to preserve their history. They just need some guidance as to how to do it and I don't know of a better place I could point them to than the National Trail of Tears Association or the state chapter where they live and many of them live where there are state chapters. Another thing I'd like to do is I'd like to make sure we're very strategic in our historic preservation back home and in, in, in their old homeland. And I think we ought to, uh, as a government, think about a national register of historic places. And that's something that I've not worked on. Councilman Keith Austin and I were talking about it. I, I think it'll be of interest to the council. I think it, you all could give us some suggestions on whether that's a good idea, how that should look. And I think the purpose of it ought to be to identify those things that are just objectively treasures that, that we have to preserve, we have to mark, and then we can help prioritize as a government about how we do that. Because uh, I think we ought to do more, actually, with historic preservation, preserving sacred sites, whether it's in the old country or, or back home. Uh, and I think part of the strategic way of, of doing that is to designate these places. But that's something that you all, I think, maybe are uniquely situated to give us some advice on. So I'd love to hear any ideas that you have, and you can reach out to me. We reach out to the staff, Councilman, former Councilman Baker and I talk, of course Julie Coates is a good contact as well. So that's something that I think uh, could, could be um, useful in our shared mission of preserving our great history because ultimately there's a point to all of this, what you do, and I touched on it before, is making sure this country doesn't forget what happened and making sure that our people, the generation coming up, understand what happened, making sure we can go back see those sites and pay the respect to our ancestors that they deserve and to make sure in this country that we don't ever do anything like this again and if we forget it we let it go away there's a chance we would do that there's a chance we'd have something lost to the generations that will come after us if they lose that history you can't get it back and so what you're doing is critically important i truly believe that from the bottom of my heart if i can do anything again to support you I want to do it. I'll be around here today. I'll be leaving tomorrow. I'll be over at the photo ID event this evening. Um, thank you all very much from the bottom of my heart. I appreciate you keeping the promise of the National Trail of Tears system. Keep up the good work. Whatever.